Okay, well, um, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, me, Graham, and Charlotte, who are very small and can't be seen, um, to talk here. Um, I'm not going to be talking about King Arthur, I'm going to be talking about the hidden history of the Scottish borders. Um, okay, last year, a program of field survey and excavation was carried out at Glen Rath in the Manor Valley as part of a community archaeology project known as Hidden History of the Scottish Borders. The project aims to record, interpret, and understand the sequence of occupation and activity in Glen Rath, a site which is often taken as a type site of a later Iron Age settlement landscape in southeast Scotland. The project aimed in particular to identify evidence for the problematic Dark Age centuries, i.e. the centuries immediately following the Roman withdrawal. And in the next 25 minutes or so, I wish to quickly outline the results of the work and the implications it has for understanding of Scottish borders archaeology. At the outset, I should state that although I'm presenting the finds today, um, it is a genuine team effort, including, as you will see throughout the lecture, a huge response from the local community, the Arthur Trail Association, the People Show Archaeological Society, and the Bigger Archaeological Trust. Particular thanks must also go to the, uh, the helpful landowner and our colleagues at Scottish Border Council and Historic Scotland. And I'm, of course, also presenting this on behalf of my two AOC colleagues, uh, Graeme and Charlotte. And anybody who took part in the work will know that I didn't do any of it. I'm just doing the lecture. The Scottish borders, including Peeblesha, has some exceptional archaeology, and the area benefited from having concerted programs of archaeological survey and excavation during a key phase in the history of modern archaeological investigations in Scotland. During the 1940s and 1950s, the Royal Commission undertook comprehensive and detailed field surveys on a scale and at a level of detail virtually unprecedented in Scotland, forming the first mapping, chronological frameworks, and sequences of prehistoric and historic settlement in development for the area. This then led to systematic studies of various settlement forms in the area, such as hill forts, with a few key sites, such as Howden Rings um, on the right here, and excavations providing the basis for regional chronologies that were to prove very influential and long-lasting. Subsequent research, expectedly and inevitably, has begun to expose some of the flaws in many of these regional post-war sequences, but the foundations of our understanding of first millennium settlement chronologies still largely derive from this original work, undertaken largely over 60 years ago. One particular area of the border surveyed by the Commission was here at Glen Rath. Their work demonstrated that the area contained a remarkable ancient landscape, home to traces of fields, cairns, and perhaps as many as 50 buildings. Amongst this wonderful landscape were distinctive circular stonewall buildings, seemingly associated with various fuel systems. This was a very rare example anywhere in southern Scotland. Interpretation at the time assumed the houses and the fuel systems were of Roman Iron Age date. No real attempt was made to disentangle the admittedly uh, difficult figurative of a landscape at that time. So this idea of a single phase plan um, of the fuel system and others like it have implicitly been taken as belonging to the Romano-British or sub-Roman centuries. This is not to say, of course, that time depth was not acknowledged. The Commission did note the presence of various other st structures in the area, such as oblong, oval and rectangular structures, and I'll return to that later. And since the post-war, the landscape has largely remained understudied. The 2013 project <coughs> aimed to revisit the sequence of occupation and activity in Glenrath, largely as it is still upheld in the literature as a type site of later Iron Age settlement landscape, and perversely due to the fact that hardly anybody had actually studied it in the last 60 years. So in June 2013, a community survey was carried out over three weeks, uh, led by AOC with the wonderful support of uh, the local community, particularly the People's Show Archaeology Society and the Bigger Archaeological Society. And it's great to see lots of people uh, who took part in the, in the work here today. We also uh, received help from local experts, including Trevor Cowie and Strat Halliday, formerly of the Royal Commission, and also the Royal Commission, who also took some training workshops, and particular thanks go to them. During the project, we used a range of techniques um, during the community training survey, ranging from plane tables, 
some wonderful drawings were done, some GPS, right through to laser scanning, the latter designed to provide minute detail of the terrain. The mix of techniques provided very successful, and slowly but surely a picture of the landscape began to emerge, and one that was far more chaotic than the previous 1950s survey. You keep that notion of chaos in your head. There's no great time to go into the full details of the survey this morning, but the primary lesson was to demonstrate the multi-period character and variation of the remains in Glenra. The landscape included scooped settlements, building platforms, isolated roundhouses, conjoined roundhouses with terraces and yards, circular buildings and field walls, small oblong structures and rectangular features. As importantly, many of these different structural types appear to be associated with different fuel systems and, and, and plots. In summary then, the survey suggested a far more complex multi-phase landscape. The latest scanning provides uh, particularly fruitful. Although features such as upstanding walls were clear to see with the naked eye, hill shading permits identification and highlights less distinct features such as ancient fuel systems, like the rig and furrow. Thus, the laser scan survey demonstrated features uh, most visible on the ground are only part of a very complicated accumulation of over overlapping archaeology. Only Strat Halliday can recognize rig and furrow on the ground, as far as I'm concerned. We wandered across and he was pointing them out, and it was only when I got the laser scan results back that I actually believed them. But, um, so, in summary, then, it was apparent from the survey that the visible remains represented an accumulation of activity in a landscape that has been repeatedly remodeled reworked and reconfigured. And with a nearby horse or covered in mind, the survey appeared to suggest that far from being a simply sub-Roman landscape, the opposite may be true. The activity may have extended before and after this period. Simplicity, therefore, overnight turned into complete chaos. Now, the following slides uh, have show one interpretation of the results, which admittedly probably does simplify and no doubt complicate the story. But the point I'm trying to get across is that you can start unpicking this complicated landscape, um, which I'll return to um, as well. We think perhaps that this, this is maybe the first stage of the, of the landscape where um, some roundhouses were built associated with some sort of field boundaries, some sort of field system. Then later various platforms and other um, field boundaries were created. And then later there was even more use um, of the landscape as well. So basically with this idea of mind, um, we then used the survey information, um, had a few weeks off, and then decided to come back and do some, some excavation. So we returned to the site uh, for two weeks in the summer, and again undertook a community excavation uh, over two structures. The roundhouse on the top left, which is associated with the fuel system, and a long rectangular building. It was hoped that excavation of these key structural types would assist in the establishment of a relative and absolute chronology for some parts uh, the, of the development of settlement in the Glenrath area, but also perhaps for similar structures throughout the wider Scottish borders. These structures were also chosen as we hoped that they would be the best way into the sort of sub-Roman or dark age periods. Let's start with the roundhouse. <clears throat> this was chosen as a representative example of many of the roundhouses of the valley, being relatively well preserved, offering the prospect of sealed deposits relating to the site's occupation, and the opportunity to demonstrate the relationship between the settlement and the major field bank system. And these slides will just give you a quick glimpse of the type of the archaeology that was uncovered. So that's obviously the site before the excavation. It's like um, afterwards, or during them. No, so here, you should know the very uh, shallow soil. Borders archaeology is famous for having no soil. So on a serious point, I mean, that <coughs> makes it difficult in terms of getting things to date, um, artifacts um, and the like. I don't want to go into this too much detail, but you should note that there, there are um, evidence of uh, secondary reuse of these buildings and that type of thing as well, so they don't appear to be um, multi-phased. Um, these are the only two pottery shards that were found in the borders. No. Um, 
but it's not far off. <laughs> and that's the pottery that we, we um, most recovered. I also found a nice um, caracol or shale uh, bracelet as well. Um, I'm being flippant, but it is actually quite rare to find artifacts, particularly like this, um, in the sort of shallow soils. You remember all the previous surveys I suggested that round houses like these and perhaps the associated field systems were likely to be Romano British in dates, and of course we wanted to test this theory. Um, so when we got the radiocarbon dates back, it was a, um, a, bit, of a, a bit of a surprise. Consistent radiocarbon dating evidence tells us that the buildings were constructed and used in the mid second millennium, most probably towards the end of the 16th century and to the earlier 15th century BC. In other words, the roundhouse was Middle Bronze Age and also one and a half thousand years earlier than previous, that had been previously envisaged. Further, although the relationship between the roundhouse and the fuel bank cannot be established with certainty, the balance of probability favours the view that the fuel system too was in use when the roundhouse was built, that is, during the Middle Bronze Age. The implication of this for our understanding of archaeology in Glenrath is that the first phase of activity far predates the Romano-British period to which the houses and the fuel system were traditionally thought to belong to. Although leading scholars like Strat Halde have pointed out that similar settlements and systems may be earlier in other areas, the recognition of the early date of the Glenrath fuel system is nonetheless surprising, as no other comparable coaxial well-ordered fuel systems have yet been identified in the area. Fuel systems of Bronze Age are rec recorded in the areas of Upland Persia, for example, and may be more widespread in southern eastern areas than were recognised at the time of the earlier Commission survey. But on the whole, they are not that common in Scotland. The implication is that some of the Glenrath remains may represent a very rare survival of a type of cultivated landscape that was perhaps more widespread in lowland Scotland below the later Bronze Age high tide that is often taken to mark the level of prehistoric survival in the uplands but it is never likely to be detected in areas subject to later agriculture. The Glenrath fuel system, therefore, offers archaeologists a unique potential for the investigation of mid-second millennium BC agricultural practices in the lowlands, particularly since buried soils relating to old ground surfaces can be expected to survive beneath both cairns and banks, allowing a very rare opportunity for purely environmental reconstruction of a Middle Bronze Age fuel system that otherwise relies on burial and peat. The opportunities in the area are immense. As an aside, although parts of the Glenrath fuel system can now be associated with the Middle Bronze Age with some confidence, there are strong indications that the fuel system continued to be used in, in later years, particularly in the Iron Age. Lynchets of substantial agricultural terraces can be detected throughout the valley in places forming new fields, but primarily respecting the, the arrangement of the earlier Bronze Age fuel systems. The evolution of the Bronze Age fuel system into that of a Middle and later Iron Age in Glenrath is also surely a key area for future research. Clearly, what is needed is a, an Aran approach whereby concern is with excavating a range of relationships within the fuel system across the landscape in a concerted attempt to pick, up, to pick apart the actual chaos. At present, we have looked at 0.001% of the landscape. Our next excavation concentrated on one of the few rectangular buildings in the valley. You remember that the correct chronological horizon for these structures was difficult to establish with confidence, and a row building could relate to relatively late use of the glen in the post-medieval period, the possibility nonetheless remained that this building may be earlier, perhaps within the first millennium AD through to the mid-second millennium AD. The purpose of the longhouse excavation, therefore, was twofold, to investigate the character of the long building, and to establish its chronological context. The first thing to note is that the longhouse was built on top of and after an Iron Age cairn and associated lynchet. Um, that's just the top of it shown through there. So this Iron Age cairn obviously provides a terminus post prem for the building, i.e. the building had to be later than that date. Now prior to excavation, it was inferred that the long building was probably built as one entity, and this follows standard practice, whereby many excavators assume that many longhouses are one period and therefore don't dig the walls, they just dig inside. However, although the structure became one building during the final phases, the community excavation demonstrates that this was the final culmination of a series of rebuilds and modifications throughout the structure's history. 
Indeed, excavations suggested that there were at least three buildings on the site. Building C, which is this scrappy bit at the top here, we think was built first. Then building B was built um, beside that or against that. <clears throat> and then later a building A was built onto building B. Subsequently, again at an unknown period, two skins of walling can join the two buildings together, making them the 20 metre longhouse as it appeared on the survey prior to excavation. Such board buildings and longhouses did, of course, have long and varied histories across Scotland, used for example as houses, fires, and various agricultural activities. One thing is certain, though, we don't think the buildings were um, a longhouse called a butt, um, which was, was thought by some prior to the excavation. Unfortunately, again, things were sparse, so we have no real clear use to the buildings, and if you could find the door there, that would be great. So what date were the buildings? Prior to excavation, the longhouse was assumed to fall within the later medieval periods. Arguing from negative evidence is always difficult, but perhaps the lack of any post-medieval pottery, a stray clay pipe, or glass was instructive. Usually on these sites, if you're digging for two weeks with eight people, you'd find something like that. For any clue of date, then, we had to rely on radiocarbon dates, but this was equally problematic. Unfortunately, all the samples were from mixed deposits, all deriving from soils associated with the platform onto which the structures were built. And these soils would have been a mixture of amalgamated material that's been churned over and accumulated and modified over many years. And these were the root radiocarbon dates that came back. As you can see, the dates go into the early Iron Age, the Roman Iron Age, and three of the dates um, are sort of the 10th to 15th centuries AD. Concern should probably be with B, the majority of dates that fall into the broad range of the 10th to 15th centuries AD. And it's our view that perhaps, therefore, that the buildings or building cannot date any much earlier than this broad period. period. Perhaps, therefore, Ian Smith was right over 30 years ago when he suggested a broad 10th to 11th century date for one of these buildings. But this may be pushing the data too far. At the very least, the C14 dates suggest construction and use sometime during the first half of the second millennium AD. As importantly, our work also shows that merely planning a longhouse and assuming that it's one entity could be entirely misleading. In summary then, the Community Survey and Excavation in Glenrath has, to our view, highlighted four key aspects relevant to Glenrath and perhaps the wider area. Within the, as within the lands aspects of a landscape is an untapped Middle Bronze Age ordered landscape, which is quite rare. Resurving the landscape with a range of techniques is highlighted that this small valley is a cha chaotic palimpsest of activity that needs careful dissection, and I mean that in a pleasant way. The enduring cross-county model of this sub-Roman ordered fuel system is too simplistic and needs to be uh, re-looked at. And that many of the building types in the area are actually earlier and more complex than previously assumed. That's all very well, but one of the key aims of the Hidden History Project was, of course, you remember, to attempt to discover the elusive dark ages of the Scottish borders, that is, the 400 roughly to 700. Now, the aim was always an ambitious one. Evidence for activity during the mid to late first millennium AD in the borders and southern Scotland in general was very scarce. The 1967 uh, Commission Inventory of Peeblesshire lists only six early Christian monuments, of which five are sculpture. And the majority of these date to the final centuries of the first millennium AD, the period after the true Dark Ages. So arguably only the Canini Stone and the Yarrow Stone date to the Dark Age period. The Latin inscription suggesting a date around the 6th century AD. Settlements are equally scarce. Identifying early medieval settlement in the border beyond the 3rd or 4th century AD is equally difficult. As we've seen, material culture is similarly problematic. The lack of reliably dated excavated sites in the first millennium in southeast Scotland means that diagnostic artifact types are virtually non-existent, while imported marker ceramics of the type often found on later early historic sites have yet to be located in significant quantities in the area. We'll talk about things like e-ware and the glass. So the thousand-year gap identified by Trevor Cowie in his study of the Manor Valley over 14 years ago still largely remains. So it is a dark age in southern Scotland. 
How do we find it? We would argue that some of the radiocarbon dates and structural remains uncovered in Glenrath do suggest that a dark age is lurking within the landscape, but we simply just haven't found them yet. This suggestion gets credence uh, from recent excellent work by CFA Archaeology, who uncovered a bag-shaped building not too dissimilar in form to building B at Glenrath. And this returned evidence of early historic occupation hidden below post-medieval use. This hackingly shows that Dark Age settlement archaeology is detectable in the borders, but probably mixed up in other chaotic landscapes. I never know why people laugh at this story. We would also argue that the perceived gap in the Dark Age record is as much an intellectual one, perpetuated by the inability of prehistorians and historians to bridge the chronological gaps between their two disciplines. Many prehistorians and Romanists end their discussion of southern archaeology when the Romans leave Scotland. Conversely, many early historic archaeologists and historians pick up the narrative during the 6th, or more often the 7th century ADs, where the archaeological and historical evidence is most apparent, more comforting, and more illuminating. The result is a dark age no man's land between the 3rd and the 6th centuries AD. My wife told me to put that maybe further, but I don't tell she was. The suggestion that our focus on particular time periods, the Roman Iron Age or the early historic period, and the more impressive archaeology of those periods is restricting our ability to recognise Dark Age is borne out actually in a wider analysis of southern Scotland during the first millennium AD. And this only came out when we were beginning to write up the site, and I found it very instructive. Many narratives of the early historic period are dominated by a few key sites, like the Dunads um, on the Whithorns, uh, with many of the discussions centred around the 7th and 8th centuries, when the inhabitants of these sites are importing exotic goods and controlling the manufacture and distribution of precious metals. However, many of these important Dark Age sites... I'm so sorry for help, just like this. Many of these Dark Age sites, though, do have evidence for the preceding two or three centuries, the 4th, the 3rd, and the 5th centuries AD, but often they are overlooked in wider narratives of early historic Scotland. But they are there if you actually look close enough. For example, here during the 4th and 5th centuries AD, a summit dune was built on top of Dunad. Again, although at Old Clute and Dundonald they're more uh, famous for being uh, later activity, they do have evidence, uh, earlier evidence. <laughs> the fact that Dark Age sites may also be looking in the undiscovered in literature is also shown by the recent relevant work by uh, my colleagues uh, Anne Cohn and Graham Cavers. Although a useful summary of the radiocarbon and dendrochronology dates, both from excavated and sampled Scottish crannogs, do highlight the preponderance of building activity and use in the early and middle Iron Age and early historic periods, they also highlight the significant number, roughly 13 of sites, that date within the Dark, dark Ages between the 3rd and 6th centuries AD. So the evidence, I believe, is there. We just need to start looking for it a bit more. Thank Matt Ritchie for allowing me to use these uh, images, by the way, done by um, uh, Rubicon. This arch archaeological reference to discuss evidence for activity during the immediate post-Roman and pre-Columbian periods across southern Scotland is shown perhaps by the recent work at Castle O'Ear. Three radiocarbon dates from the site were returned, 2nd century BC to AD 412, AD 231 to 537, AD 126 to 537. These dates surely show that activity took place on the site in the immediate post-Roman period. Discussing the results, so other scholars have stated that, by comparison with what is known by of other forts on the eastern borders, the radiocarbon dates from the defences on the site are unusual. One must surely ask why they're unusual. Is it perhaps more accurate to say that they simply do not fit into our normal perceptions of what structures date to what period? If anything, the dates suggest that by the beginning of the first millennium AD, um, this actual area was quite vibrant. And again, um, you think back to the, the work done by the CFA here. So maybe the Dark Ages are in these areas um, if we start picking apart the details. I want to end this morning's lecture by paying tribute to the community who made the work possible. Bailey Stallworks for the People Show Archaeological Society and Bigger Archaeological Trust. In total, 66 people of all ages participated in the survey and excavations um, in all weathers. And these participants contributed over 1,200 person hours to the project. Um, the project could not have worked without uh, the community involvement. 
as well as the on-site work, we had a um, related secondary schools program which involved 77 people, of which six people then came into the work placement for a week um, in AOC. And some of them have actually still what to do archaeology in their future careers, which is wonderful. We also did a, an associated schools program. Um, and over the course of the period, we did 126 uh, 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 people visits um, as well. And here are some thoughts from the children after they finished their poop and pottery workshop. We're so grateful to everyone who contributed to the project. Um, it literally could not have happened without them. And I hope that this overview this morning does justice to your efforts and you recognize the contribution that your work has made in writing a new exciting, innovative, if somewhat chaotic, chapter in the border of industry. Thank you very much.